I think if I were CMO of crypto, which would be sort of be an oxymoron in and of itself, <laughs> uh, I would step away from sort of like any startup company that focuses too much on the technology and I'd focus on the values and I'd focus on the emotional side of this and help people connect to the things that they actually care about and help them understand that this is actually a path to give them the things that they care about, preserving their wealth, keeping their identity safe, preserving themselves from surveillance by, you know, big brother, big sister, what have you. Those are the things that I think I'd focus on. You are listening to Power Marketing with Kevin Lee. Kevin and his agency Did It have helped thousands of businesses win through superior marketing, as have his books, articles, speaking engagements, and the eMarketing Association Power Marketing Podcasts. Here's Kevin. I'm super excited to be catching up with Jeremy Epstein, who it's been ages since we've had a chance to catch up. So I was like to turn that into a podcast and so, Jeremy, uh, you know, I'd love to talk uh, with you about uh, the marketing of crypto, which has gone through a huge roller coaster in in the last few years. And I, I think there's a bit of a general reputation management issue at the industry level that crypto is facing. And I'd love to, you know, hear your thoughts about, you know, how crypto as a as an organ as a, a category should think about addressing that. And then on an individualized basis, if sort of you were uh, suddenly tasked with um, marketing either a specific crypto uh, initiative or or blockchain, which people constantly conflate. Like, how would you do that differently now than you did in the past when you were marketing crypto? Mm, yeah, great question. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the on the show, and uh, congratulations on all the growth you've had uh, across all the various logos sitting behind you, which everyone should stare at multiple for multiple minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I'm not going to lie. It's a tough time to be in the crypto world because I really feel it's a little demoralizing right now. It seems like the world is, is stacked up against you. And I think you're right that the crypto industry, uh, has not done itself a great service in terms of communicating, uh, what the values are. Too often we talk about things like, uh, decentralization and re removal of intermediaries and uh, automated smart contracts. And those are all fantastic things. But I think the, the, you talked about cause marketing. I think really behind crypto is the idea that there's a cause here. And this cause is uh, that of self-sovereignty, of self-reliance, of liberty, of freedom, of all these sort of eternal uh, American slash Western values that people really, really care about. Um, you know, I think that's what this, this whole movement is really is about. If you go back and I tell people, anyone who's genuinely interested in studying and understanding crypto, uh, you should go read the Bitcoin white paper. It's like reading, uh, you know, the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, like, it's it's the first thing you should go read. And it's not beyond most people's reach. You know, I tell people, print it out so you don't have any distractions. Get a cup of coffee, read it through twice, and you'll get it. And basically, you'll understand, like, yeah, there's some math at the end. But it's really about giving people freedom from what Satoshi Nakamoto viewed as the tyranny of central banks. And that's a really important value. So I think if I were... CMO of crypto, which would be sort of be an oxymoron in and of itself. <laughs> uh, I would step away from sort of like any startup company that focuses too much on the technology. And I'd focus on the values and I'd focus on the emotional side of this and help people connect to the things that they actually care about and help them understand that this is actually a path to give them the things that they care about, preserving their wealth, keeping their identity safe, preserving themselves from surveillance by, you know, big brother, big sister, what have you. Those are the things that I think I'd focus on. Sure. You know, I mean, uh, while I have dabbled in crypto a little bit and I've got, got my Coinbase account and I've, I've never bothered with hardware wallets because it's not a big enough number to bother with. Um, you know, I think for me, the more exciting side of blockchain is not the cryptocurrencies. It's actually smart contracts in general um, and the way in which smart contracts can uh, enable things like DAOs uh, how they can enable uh, add value 
to physical and or experiential elements. I think to me, that's much more fascinating because it, it commingles sort of reality with uh, digital, you know, digital records, you know, impenetrable or, or difficult to forge digital records around authenticity of a product or about the fact that I went to the Depeche Mode concert at Madison Square Garden, like, you know, a, a, an NFT ticket of that, that included all sorts of special, you know, things would be much more interesting to me, right, than a regular NFT, for example, because this is tied to an experience. So I sort of, I'm much more excited about that. I'm also excited about opportunities around digital royalties uh, for intellectual property, right, yeah. and the fact that smart contracts em empower that. So I sort of feel like, unfortunately, some of these other things were like the babies got that got thrown out with the bathwater, right? totally. uh, as sort of the as the crypto ecosystem sort of lost some traction, you know, due to some bad, bad players potentially or poor planning, or there's a variety of factors I think involved. You mm -hmm. know, some of these other things lost steam as well. Yeah, so I'd love to hear, like, as somebody who's been far more immersed in the category than I have, you know, where do you sort of feel like the non-currency related other tokenized elements come in, and where you see the opportunity? Is it is it DAOs? Is it you know, um, sort of the experiential NFTs or, or, or music royalties or uh, content royalties. You know, where do you think the next big opportunity is that will sort of shake off the, the doom and gloom of the blockchain industry? Yeah, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with D, all of the above. Um, you know, I think it's important to understand, like, when we talk about cryptocurrency, people think in a very sort of um, uh, very... Uh, understandably kind of surface level of this is about transacting the way I would hand someone a $20 bill. But in order for a decentralized network using a blockchain to really function, there has to be a crypto, a, a, a crypto economic mechanism behind that that can only use crypto tokens or cryptocurrency to pay for security, to pay for transaction fees, to guarantee that a, a, a smart contract gets executed. That can't happen uh, absent uh, a cryptocurrency, essentially, because you need to pay the actors to make sure that the network uh, maintains its integrity. Uh, that being said, you know, once you get into things like smart contracts, you're totally right. I mean, the cost of doing business, you know, is we don't, I don't think we all think about sort of the invisible cost, but you know, you, you set up a contract with a vendor and there's costs involved. Visa takes a three and a half percent cut. You know, you do cause marketing and they always say like, do you want to top up with the, you know, to pay for the credit card surcharge of $5, $10, whatever it is. Well, that can be reduced by orders of magnitude using a smart contract because you can remove that third party. So the smart contract element is, is ginormous. But I agree with you about the NFTs. I mean, why not? You should have a digital uh, keepsake that's unique. I mean, people collect all kinds of things. Why not have a digital collectible? Uh, I, I just went to see the new uh, movie Air, which is basically like a two-hour Nike commercial. But you think about <laughs> is that I paid to watch, which is great. Good for them. That's how good they are in marketing, right? Um, but you think about all the people who are sneakerheads, right? They're people who collect all kinds of things. So why wouldn't you collect your ticket stubs from your concerts that proves that you were there, that ha you had a seat, that, that proves you listened to some shows? That makes total sense. So I think everything you're saying, but here's the problem, Kevin. The problem is right now that we're, we have this grand vision for an internet of value, you know, powered by blockchain networks. But what we don't, what we have also is like, uh, dial-up modem level infrastructure. So you and I are old enough to remember the heydays of the dot-com era. And everyone was talking about how the world was changed. Streaming audio, you probably did voice over IP phone back, you know, net to phone or whatever. That was crappy upon crappy. But conceptually, we were like, wow, this is a game changer. But the infrastructure wasn't ready. It took 5, 10, 15 years for the infrastructure to catch up. So you ask me what's going to be the next big thing. The next big thing is when we roll out the crypto broadband, when we roll out all of those crypto, the equivalent of the crypto data centers, when those things come online and they are coming, then you're going to see the social media take off. Then you're seeing the mobile take off. Then you're going to see 
everything that we saw with the internet that we envisioned back in the mid nineties, but it didn't really happen until 2010. Now we're going to have the exact same thing. So the gap is the infrastructure, but we're laying the fiber right now and then eventually we'll get there. And then this regulatory environment has to clear up at the same time. And sadly, the U S is looking like we, we, we are trying our best to lose, <laughs> which is, yeah, sad. there's certainly uh yeah. The, well, I, you know, there's nothing like some uh, flame outs to suddenly get regulators excited about regulating. Um, but I'd love to talk, you know, more about sort of the intersection of, uh, the, the advertising and marketing ecosystem and, and privacy. And, you know, obviously the Brave browser is sort of taking a valiant step in trying mm -hmm. to sort of use blockchain and tokenization to solve a bunch of problems at the same time, but yet has had a, a real challenge reaching critical mass. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to sit, opine on, you know, is that the solution? Are there other solutions that can allow people to maintain their privacy, perhaps even get compensated for the value of their eyeballs and the value yeah. of their, you know, their attention and their behavior, which is essentially what giving forward is doing, but in a cause marketing context, but we stayed away from tokenization just because we had seen so many headwinds there, right? Because a bunch of people said, oh, do a white paper. And, you know, these days you can spin up a blockchain on Amazon in like 10 minutes. Yeah, we were, we, we, we chose to sort of wait and, and right. see, wait for the dust to settle a little bit before we went down that path. But, you know, Brave continues to bravely forge ahead and right. there are a few others as well. So I'd love to get your, your thoughts on that as somebody who's wearing the marketing hat and the crypto hat and the blockchain hat at the same time. Yeah, you nailed it. I mean, I've used Brave as a consumer. I think Brave is the greatest thing ever. I use it on all my devices. I love seeing it like 27 different things have been blocked. I have it. I've also used Brave as a CMO and it's terrible because it, I mean, that's not to say it's, sorry, I, I shouldn't say that. I have very good friends who work at Brave and if they ever hear this, they're going to yell at me. It's not terrible. It's very good at building awareness, but you, if you're a CMO who's, who has an alternative of saying, oh, I know I can get my performance marketing results from Google or LinkedIn or whatever, and then you go to Brave, you, you lose all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of, rethink how you measure your 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 ad spend if you're going down the brave route now i happen to think that brave whether it's brave or not i don't know but the brave model of paying people for their attention is ultimately going to win it might take a while but it's like i mean and they have what 100 million users so it's not like a it's like enough or 100 million. they have 100 million downloads i don't know how many users they have but whatever but the point is, it's a, if you can get paid for your comp, uh, compensated for your attention, and then that attention can be turned into something of value for you, more and more people will do it. And then advertisers will have to figure out how to build truly, you know, good old Seth Godin permission based relationships with people, uh, to get that done. I think right now, the challenge they, the brave doesn't know what the best way is to get that critical mass and should I get users by bringing them in, but I got to get paid for their attention. But advertisers have a hard time adjusting to that model because they don't know how to quantify and, and value that attention that they're paying for because it's sort of a new paradigm that they have to adjust to. So I think it's going to take a while for that to shake out, but ultimately that model makes a lot more sense. Plus I think it's going to, um, you know, as you know, probably better than I do, definitely better than I do. Like, the the advertising industry right now is rife with inefficiencies, rife with deception, rife with fraud, and you're spending a lot of money that you're not getting value for. So that has to that can and should be cleared out um, with a sort of blockchain attention based model. But I don't think we've seen that one come to fruition yet either. Yeah, there's there's no doubt that uh, there, that the, that model, and again, it may be brave, it may be somebody else, but the you know, it has both headwinds and tailwinds, right? I think, right. The, you know, um, the the CMO in me and the agency owner in, in me is sort of entranced by this concept that good advertising actually delights the consumer if it's timely and relevant, right? right? But as you take away targeting, the chances that you're going to delight the consumer go down precipitously. Totally. Right? And I, and I think back to, you know... Um, the days of 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 print, right? When 
you know, the, the 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 fall issue of Vogue would come out, right? And I wasn't the Vogue reader, but you know, I watched to see what would happen. Right. And and that was the best selling issue, I think, of Vogue. It was and like a phone book, right? 80%, yeah, it was about 80% <laughs> advertising. Right. 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 But the advertising was so relevant because it was fashion advertising in a fashion magazine. Right. And the people consuming the the editorial content were equally delighted with the advertising because it was yeah. so hyper relevant to them. You know, that's sort of the the nirvana of of, right. of advertising is can you be so hyper relevant that the person's excited to see your advertising? Unfortunately, when you have this supply demand system where you're stripping out the ability to target, you know, and you need to sort of figure out how to layer that back in while respecting privacy, that's the head that that's the balancing act that I think the the industry is still struggling with. Um, because as we lo- lose IDFA, as we lose third party cookies, you know, can a brave browser with authenticated users come in and say, let's see, how do we layer in right. the level of targeting that would make a performance marketer in particular excited? Right. You know, I was on Twitter. I'm a big Twitter user. That's like my only social network these days. I mean, I check LinkedIn once or twice a day, but basically I'm Twitter. But I, all the video ads that are interstitial on my on my Twitter feed, like they they do these incredible product demos. And I'm think I thought to myself yesterday, I'm like, damn, like every single one of these items is something that like <laughs> I'm like, I could buy, I should buy that. Like, and I'm surprised I haven't yet. But I'm like, the, the relevancy of like there was this like little thing like clean out under the fridge. And I'm like, I'm totally OCD. I need that. You know, and it was like all these little things. And I was like, God, these demos are so spot on for me. And I was like, this it, it didn't even feel annoying the way most advertising. I was like, oh, that's a clever idea. I should go get that. You know, it was right. like, you're right. It's it should delight you, you know, and yeah, I agree with you. I think Brave has a phenomenal opportunity, um, but I think they have to figure out how to navigate towards it. It, it should be interesting to, to see if that how that plays out. Yeah, I, I, you're probably paying closer attention to it than, than I have. But the other thing that's fascinating to me is the concept of a DAO, it, mm. it, like the theory of a DAO. It really resonates with me, you know, having been on different boards over the years. And having seen the lopsided situation with volunteer-run organizations, whether the industry trade associations and, and folks like that, you know, there, there's a bunch of people on a board, for example, and, and you know, there's an 80-20 rule or 90-10 rule where a lot, well, some folks do all the heavy lifting, but yep. everyone gets equal credit, right? Well, that's not fair, right? right? And and then, you you know, when I when I acquired the eMarketing Association, I started to look at it at DAOs, but I had really not seen any successful ones that I could immediately sort of figure out how to, you know, how do I create, you know, instead of a franchise model for the e-marketing association, for example, which is what I initially thought mm-hmm. about with hyper-local chapters run by chapter leaders, I thought to myself, well, wouldn't it be cool if if it was a DAO, right? Wouldn't it yeah. be cool if even though the Boise, Idaho chapter was very, very small, it got Warren Buffett to come speak and it yeah. drove like an inordinate amount of revenue from, you know, from the digital event than people wanting to go see that. Like ordinarily, like there's no way to properly compensate right. that person who like had an outsized impact to the organization. I mean, you could try to do it without, you know, in, yeah. in a sort of standard framework, you know, uh, affiliate marketing style. Right. Right. But that doesn't that, that doesn't compensate an individual for the equity, essentially, that they're building in the organization. Right. It just it's a more uh, just slice of time. Right. That they would get their rev share or whatever. So yeah. I'd love to hear whether you think that there's still uh, opportunity because uh, if there have been any successful DAOs, you know, that that reach critical mass, I haven't seen them yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, that I think your model is interesting because I think it could also be a DAO of DAOs. Like Boise, Idaho should be its own DAO. And then it should be that DAO should be a member of the larger national DAO. So it's like a DAO of DAOs. And then that DAO would get the reputational uh, respect that it deserves from all the other DAOs. So, you know, I I think short answer is it comes back to the infrastructure excuse I'm going to throw from before. But I think there have been a couple interesting cases of DAOs that have sort of shown up. The, the one that comes to mind right off the bat is the one that got came together for the con- to try to buy the Constitution, 
Mm. Right. So there was a copy of the constitution that went up for sale and a Dow came together and basically pulled its assets and asked and, and was, and was bidding up uh, on behalf of many, many people with online voting, what have you to, to buy the constitution. Now, another thing is I've actually done work for two Dow's. I went into a, you know, bulletin board, basically submitted a proposal. It was voted on. I've done it three times. One time I was rejected, twice I was accepted. And I made a proposal. And then there was a voting of the membership. And based on that, I actually uh, was awarded a contract. And then based on certain milestones, I submitted proof of the work, basically like good old proof of work. Once that had been accepted by the DAO, the money was released by a smart contract into my crypto wallet. So like I saw sort of the the primordial example of how a decentralized group of people around the world voting, controlling a central, uh, 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 a pool of, of assets could basically come together collectively to make a decision and then allocate resources to support that decision and then hold people accountable and get reputation. And I earned reputation points along the way. So short answer is I've seen a little bit I don't think anything I could talk about at scale, but to me, we're at the, this is all proof of concepts. It's frustrating, man, because I wish it was all done. And then people were like, oh, Jeremy, you're a fucking genius. But, you know, clearly we haven't gotten to that point yet. <laughs> and we may well, never. I look forward to continue to watch that category because I do think there's there's a kernel of something there that that is really powerful. Yeah. Um, you know, even when you, 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 when you look at it from a securitization and company ownership perspective, right? I mean, I, you know, I, I get opportunities to vote for my little teeny tiny packet of Microsoft shares that I own, right? right? You know, right. Uh, is, is my vote going to make a difference? No, but they have you know, the ability for shareholders to vote, right? And and so, you know, securities in the United States are fairly democratized, but yeah. they're lopsidedly democratized because of the fact that, you know, somebody who who disproportionately owns the shares has more voting power, but that isn't that the way it should be. Right. Cause yeah, you know, yeah. they're the ones who placed the biggest bet on the company. I'm so wondering, I, Kevin, have you, did you ever read the book, the network state? Have you heard of it? No, I have not. I'd like to suggest that you see if you can pick it up. It's by a uh, Balaji Srinivasan who you may have heard of. He's the one who made a million, a bet that Bitcoin would reach a million dollars within yes. 90 days. Yeah, I think uh, he wrote coming a book. up on uh, halfway yeah, over. I don't think he's, he's going to get his. Uh... Well, you never know. We don't we don't like <laughs> to call the game till till the bot the ninth inning, you know. But it's definitely at the moment not looking great for him. I'll grant you that. But um, it's a phenomenal uh, thought piece on how essentially we're we're mi- migrating into this DAO first, almost digital nation state world, where you'll have DAOs that then collectively decide to buy real estate. And then start governing different pieces of, you know, property around the world and that those become sort of the leading entities of the world. And it's just a really fascinating kind of um, uh, look or p- look into one possible future. So I think you might enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as to his his bet, you know, given his 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 crypto wealth, it's de minimis. Right. And right. Um, he, he wanted to make a point and he made the he did. point. Right. So, he did. you know. I think he it, doesn't if, care, right? if his, if his, I can't remember, I think they did the math on the all in podcast that a couple of weeks ago when basically decided that it, the bet would pay for itself with even a slight yeah. increase in trust in, in, in Bitcoin in the interim. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't I mean, think I, I try, I, I guess like I, I give him the benefit of the doubt. Like, I don't think it was about the money for him. Like he genuinely believes that the financial system is, like essentially the Titanic and it's hit the iceberg and we're in the early stages where most people are in denial that the ship's going down. Yeah. I mean, I'm still on the fence as to whether or not the existing crypto infrastructure is truly, you know, the solution, right? Because it has its own issues and has, has, you know, for sure. Crack, for sure. cracks in that dike as well um, that have not shown up necessarily with Bitcoin either, but certainly with some of the others. Oh, a hundred percent. Hundred percent. You know, so uh, so we'll have to we'll have to watch that pretty carefully. But uh, what, what what has you excited over the next year? I mean, obviously, you know, the intersection of AI and blockchain is a pretty interesting thing. Any anything going on there that people should take a look at? There is. There's actually a, the most interesting project in that space that I've been following for a couple of years is called Singularity Net, 
Um, and that's essentially their talk about cause. Their argument is like, we're all caught up in AI and chat GPT. And like you and I both know it's amazing. But uh, if the power of AI resides solely in Microsoft or Google's or the US government or the Chinese government's hands, like it's ultimately more likely to end up into that dystopian Terminator future that people fear. Right. Not guarantees, but more likely because those companies are and or governments are going to do what they do. So what singularity is that says is, no, we need to create a decentralized infrastructure that's beyond the control of any one entity, but allows for the same type of artificial tel- intelligence and ultimately artificial general intelligence. So uh, they're building out an infrastructure to do exactly that. And they've been doing it for a couple of years. It's not easy, but essentially You can create an AI agent uh, or put some data on a blockchain and then basically you become the rights holder coming back to property uh, uh, royalties that you mentioned before. And so anytime somebody says, hey, I'm going to use this agent, you get a micropayment for for having created that AI agent. And then essentially, but that agent becomes the property of every or available to everybody and beyond anyone's control, but you still as the owner get Right, so so I think Singularity Net is just absolutely fascinating. Whether they can pull it off, a I'm certainly rooting for them. Full disclosure, I have a small share. Uh, I do have some tokens, um, but I think that's one to definitely uh, to be able. I think there's SingularityNet.io if people want to check out that project. So I, I think you're spot on in that direction. Um, I think the other things that I'm really starting to look at a lot more is like energy and clean tech. Uh, I think everybody's, it's not a secret that that's a big opportunity. So specifically though, um, I think solar and wind are obvious and also have their own issues. The ones that uh, I've been digging into recently are uh, geothermal engineering and micronuclear fusion. Uh, Those are two that just really fascinate me and offer a lot of potential and feel like they're sort of on that cusp. So I can't claim to be an expert in either of those, but I have been starting to explore them. Yeah, How about absolutely. you. Um, yeah, the uh, on on the uh, certainly AI is going to be transformative, and it's it's moving so quickly that it's hard to know uh, where the transformation is going to hit hardest and hit fastest. But there's no doubt about it. I right. mean, you know, human brains are designed to think linearly, right? So it's very difficult for us to think exponentially. But that's right. the speed at which this is moving. So I think you just have to consistently remind yourself that this is moving at a exponential rate and so that your ability to predict off of a straight line graph is impossible because it's not I moving know. at a straight line so I, that, that's that's going to be really fascinating but there are so many issues where the applications of ai are moving much more quickly than the legal infrastructure particularly as it relates to things like the you know ip right, right. and that's both from the perspective of ip having been used to train an ai and therefore perhaps even though only you know Two percent of a particular piece of of content was used to train the AI that then spit out a really valuable result, right? And should that two percent accrue back, you know, is there room for like an ASCAP style model for, that exists for music, where like mm. all the value gets aggregated into one place and redistributed? I mean, that sort of would seem to be like an obvious place where blockchain would yeah help yeah solve for sure the for AI sure. intellectual property issues as it relates to you know, I've got a corpus of information or a corpus of value, or I'm an entertainer, like the whole thing with Drake and The Weeknd, right? Right, but, right. You know, how do you deal with that, right? The It's moving way too quickly for, so you know, lawyers who don't even understand how the internet works, much less blockchain or, or, <laughs> or anything else, right, to, to deal with these uh, issues. And then so, what happens when the AI creates the IP? Right. Because yeah. the copyright office right now will not give you copyright on uh, AI-generated property it's not considered right. copyrightable um right. and and i think that they're they're starting to think about okay well what extent of massaging is required right when grammarly corrects my sentence because it sucked right did i write the sentence right. or did grammarly write the sentence well again it give me the copyright because grammarly just well what if microsoft word corrected my spelling Right. Right. You know, I mean, where's the line? Right. I mean, I took a I was writing a recommendation for someone the other day and she sent me, I said, give me a couple bullet points you want me to highlight, gave it to me. And I said, and then I I, I put into chat GPT, 
I need a recommendation for this person that comes in this tone, sounds this about this page. With the, boom, the thing kicked it out. I made a couple tweaks. Okay, who who created that? Right. Yeah, because was your prompt the thing that was the creative right. action? Right. I think again, this stuff is like way early. I know, right? But it's moving very quickly, right? So yeah, yeah, um, it's fascinating. It, 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 there are so many implications that you know it's a little bit mind bending, but that's fun, right? That's why we get up in the morning, right? Is that is why we get the is, part I struggle with is like I'm not quite sure what to tell my children. <laughs> Like, yeah, well, I, my, my teenagers, I basically said, remember all the job titles that you see out there in the world? Those are all changing, right? Yeah, I did. So, I did tell them that the job I have now uh, didn't exist when I graduated from college. So try to keep that in mind. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and that's the most likely. Well, well, it was great catching up with you, Jeremy. And, uh, you know, great. Thank you. Checking back in to see, uh, you know, as the world changes at a thousand miles an hour, I'm sure that... Uh, We'll, we'll both be trying trying to figure out ways to add value along the way. You got it. Well, thanks for having me, Kevin. Keep up the good work, sir. Sounds good. Take care. Bye-bye. Kevin Lee's Power Marketing is available on all your favorite podcast networks. Kevin loves helping businesses excel at marketing. Having marketing challenges? Just like Santa in the Miracle on 34th Street. If Kevin can't help you, he'll know someone who can. Find him on LinkedIn, subscribe or follow.